Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Does Science, and today I want to discuss eigenvalues and eigenstates in tensor product state spaces in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. Tensor product state spaces allow us to describe complex quantum systems using simpler components. One example is a particle moving in three spatial dimensions. We can think of it as the combination of a particle moving separately in the x, y, and z spatial dimensions. Another example is a multiparticle system, which can be thought of as the combination of individual separate single particle systems. The aim of this video is to study eigenvalues and eigenstates in these tensor product state spaces. We'll find that under certain conditions, we can build the eigenvalues and eigenstates of the full system by simple combinations of the eigenvalues and eigenstates of the simpler component systems. These results find many applications, and you can find examples by following the links in the description, which include the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator, or a system of two interacting quantum particles. Let's go! Let's consider a state space V1, and in this state space we'll consider an operator A that obeys this eigenvalue equation. As usual, the lambda here are the eigenvalues, and the psi here are the eigenstates. We also consider another state space V2, in which we'll work with an operator B, that obeys this other eigenvalue equation, where the mu are the eigenvalues, and the phi are the eigenstates. Starting from these two state spaces, we can build the state space V as the tensor product between V1 and V2. We consider an operator C that acts on V, and this will be its eigenvalue equation, where the omega are the eigenvalues and the chi are the eigenstates. What we'll do today is to limit our discussion to a very specific form for the operator C. We'll write it as the sum of the operator A and the operator B. If you've seen our video on tensor product state spaces, then you'll recognize this expression as the extension of the operator A from its original state space V1 to the tensor product state space V, where this subindex indicates that the operator A comes from V1, and where this here is the identity operator in V2. Similarly, this here is the extension of B from V2 to V, with the identity operator in V1 here, and the subindex 2 here indicating that B comes from V2. We need to include the identity operators because the operator C acts on the tensor product state space V, and therefore each of its terms must also do that. If you haven't seen the video on tensor product state spaces yet, then I suggest that you watch it first and you come back to this video afterwards. So, why do we limit ourselves to this very specific form for the operator C? The reason is that we'll see that in this case we can build the eigenvalues and eigenstates in the tensor product state space V up here from the eigenvalues and eigenstates of the two individual state spaces V1 here and V2 here. What this means is that the calculations in the tensor product state space are greatly simplified. However, this would only be useful if we had plenty of situations in which we encounter operators C that take this form. And, as you may suspect, this is indeed the case. A general situation where this happens is when we have a particle moving in the usual three-dimensional space. In this case, the full three dimensions are described by a tensor product state space V, made of the tensor product of the state spaces associated with each individual spatial dimension. As a concrete example, you can check out the video on the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator, linked in the description, which is described by a Hamiltonian, that is the sum of a Hamiltonian along x, a Hamiltonian along y, and a Hamiltonian along z. Where the Hamiltonian along x takes the usual expression for the one-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator, with its kinetic energy part and its potential energy part, and we would have similar expressions for one-dimensional oscillators along y and along z. So, as we can see, the Hamiltonian h of a particle moving in a three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator takes the same form as the operator c that we'll investigate today, so everything we learn will immediately be applicable to this system. If we make some room, another common situation is a multiparticle system, such as a two-particle system. In this case, the full system is described by a tensor product state space V, 
made of the tensor product of the state spaces associated with each individual particle. As a concrete example, in the video on two interacting quantum particles, also linked in the description, we find that the Hamiltonian H of two particles interacting via potential that depends on their relative position can be written as the sum over a center of mass Hamiltonian and a relative Hamiltonian. In this expression, the center of mass Hamiltonian describes a fictitious particle of mass capital M moving freely, so that we only have a kinetic energy term, and the relative Hamiltonian is given by the kinetic energy of another single fictitious particle whose mass little m is the reduced mass of the system, moving in the relative potential u. You can find all the details about two particle systems in the linked video, and note that here I'm using a slightly different notation for the reduced mass and the relative potential, so that we don't confuse the terms with other important quantities in this video. Again, the Hamiltonian H of the two particle system takes the same form as the operator C that we'll investigate today. So everything we learn will also be immediately applicable to this system. What we'll learn today is that both of these examples correspond to situations in which the eigenvalues and eigenstates in the tensor product state space can be constructed from those in the individual state spaces. What we'll do is we'll keep the discussion general in terms of operators A, B, and C, but you can think of these more concrete examples we've just discussed if you find that helpful. Let's start by constructing the tensor product state between psi and phi. As such, this state belongs to the state space V, which is the tensor product between V1 and V2. What I want to show next is that this tensor product is in fact an eigenstate of the operator C up here. To see this, let's consider the action of C on the tensor product state. We can expand the operator C in this special form we're considering today, all acting on the tensor product state. What we need now is to remember the action of operators on tensor product states from the video on tensor products. A general tensor product operator P, Q, acting on a general tensor product state alpha, beta, is such that the operator from the first state space only acts on the state from the same state space, and the operator from the second state space only acts on the state from the second state space. Using this result, we can rewrite the action of this first term as the tensor product of this in V1 with this in V2 and then the action of this second term as the tensor product of this in V1 with this in V2. This here is the eigenvalue equation in V1. The identity operator here does not change the state. The same goes for this identity operator here. And this is the eigenvalue equation in V2. Overall, we end up with lambda times the tensor product state plus mu times the tensor product state. Finally, we can rewrite this as lambda plus mu times the tensor product state, which is a common factor. What does this mean? We see that the action of C on this state gives this scalar times the same state. This means that the tensor product state is an eigenstate of C. Looking at the eigenvalue equation of C up here, this means that we can write the eigenstate chi as this tensor product state. We also see that the eigenvalue associated with chi is lambda plus mu, so we can write the eigenvalue omega of c as equal to lambda plus mu. And this is it. To recap, let's first consider the setup. We have a state space v1 with an operator a that obeys this eigenvalue equation and we have a second state space V2 with another operator B that obeys this eigenvalue equation. We then build a state space V that is the tensor product between V1 and V2, and we consider an operator C acting in V that obeys this other eigenvalue equation. We've limited our discussion to operators C that have a specific form given by the sum of the operator A and the operator B. With this setup, what we've shown today is that we can construct the eigenstates chi of the operator C 
as the tensor product of the eigenstate of operators A and B. And that we can construct the corresponding eigenvalues omega as the sum of the eigenvalues of A and B. This result greatly simplifies calculations because it means that we can work in the simpler individual state spaces V1 and V2, and once we've solved the problem there, we can straight away construct the solutions for the tensor product state space V. And before we finish, we should briefly mention notation. When we work with tensor products, we almost always simplify notation, so when you check our other videos or any other resources, keep in mind that expressions such as C, which is given by the sum of these two terms, are typically simplified to this sum over two terms, where we omit the identity operators and the tensor product symbols. My advice is that although this simple notation is very convenient, you should never forget that we really have tensor products. You're now ready to apply the results we've discussed today about eigenvalues and eigenstates in tensor product state spaces. Good examples for this include the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator or a system of two interacting quantum particles. And as always, if you like the video, please subscribe.